future philosophers. Yeah. I took a 300 level <laughs> philosophy course intro to existentialism, but I certainly did not ace it. And I do not consider myself a philosopher by any means. So we are armchair quarterbacking. But that said, we love Nietzsche's work for three reasons. And first, really, his ideas around self-development were and are groundbreaking. Yeah. yeah. And when we unpack them, as we will in a little bit here, there's a lot to dig into. Well, we're looking at what, 1870? Exactly. So there is a lot going on in world history as well to keep in mind. Now, yeah. the second is that more than 100 years later, behavioral science has actually picked up and is now scientifically proving his relevance yeah. and his work. Yes. Which is really exciting. And now third is that Nietzsche stated in his own works that he is not writing for the masses. This is one of my favorite things because this is one of those points where when I got into self-development and I was sharing all these ideas, I was met with criticism and, and people just dumping on me and laughing and like, what do you need that for? And even to this day, even to this day and which, so I know and feel that everybody should be in the self-development, but unfortunately only the create the, the courageous are going to get right. into the it. The self actualizers, because it, there's a lot of work with this. And in in his uh, book, thus spoke Zarathustra. Uh, Zarathustra comes down from the mountains to to give the world his knowledge that he had acquired in the ten years of solitude that he had put himself in, and. He comes down to teach everyone the overman. And the overman was this idea that you have to overcome oneself to become who you actually are, which is utterly brilliant. We could break that down in a million different ways, but I, I love that. And he's spouting all this off and he's so excited to share with everybody. And they all, the crowds then begin to ridicule and laugh at him about this idea. And understanding what we're about to dive into we know that transformation self-actualization is not for everyone and i want to also state that he upon coming down from the hill he had found this this other old man and, and was telling the old man that i've been in the mountains i have all this information i have all this knowledge and i've come down to share it and he was starting to explain it to the old man and the old man says yeah that's not that's gonna that's not gonna go down so well no and he's like, well, you know, that's just one person. And he continues on. And, and so he find, finds this crowd and he begins to do his thing. And yeah, that's, they, they just start tearing him apart. Now, to kick this all off, we want to talk about envy because it also gets a bad rap. A lot of us view envy as a very negative thing. And because of it, we feel bad about ourselves when we are envious, but envy can actually be a driving force in our transformation. There's many of them. That is certainly one of them. And Nietzsche viewed envy as a very powerful driving force for a better person. Yes. Now, why do we feel envy? Well, along with a lot of the other emotions that come with this, we, we want to be better. We, it's, it's kind of like that we've been we've been this acorn that has been planted and we want to actualize our true potential i think everybody does there is feelings of this this need to be to to become your best self and so when we see other people going outside of their comfort zones to actualize their true potential and we're not acting upon our own, well then it's in order for us to self-soothe what's going on with us, we then attack other people. Now, it's what you do with the envy. Yes. That's important. That's the caveat. But there's nothing wrong with feeling envious. There's nothing no. wrong with envy. We want to turn it into a motivator. So when we see something that someone else has, we don't have to look at it as beating ourselves up or a negative thing, we need to turn that into, oh, I want that too. What do I have to do to get to that place? What do I have to do to achieve that? And it's not a reason to complain. Mm -hmm. 
I hear this a lot online, you know, people bash envy, people complain about feeling envious. Yeah. You need to understand that these feelings and emotions, as we've talked about over the last year plus, these are normal. They're not going away. And your attempts to hide them, obfuscate them, try to run from them, what ends up happening is even worse than just feeling the emotion yes. and processing it. Yes, yeah, so you put yourself, you're digging a, a hole for yourself that you continue to get deeper in. And the other thing about it is, we, we've talked about this with Russ Harris and the happiness, and the happiness trap, which is th through our, the culture that we live in here in America, there is a lot of p put on consumerism and uh, certainly enviness of other people are doing these things and we need to do these things as well. And so we get into this rat race of things that we will, we think will allow those upsetting feelings to wash away. And we, we get off track of our, of our self actualizing ourselves. We get off track of pursuing ourselves being greater. And we start chasing these things that we feel that would allow these, these envy and jealousy and anxiety to wash away. And all of those are trying to push us in the right direction. And we have a lot of other systems and for, for Nietzsche and, and his predecessors, Schopenhauer, which is we have all these ancient systems such as uh, reproduction, uh, you know, uh, uh, consuming, eating, uh, pleasure that that are all fighting for the same attention. And because they're all fighting for the same attention, the ones that speak louder are going to get fed. But this is why it's so difficult as a young person, you have all these hormones of sexuality raging that you're trying to contend with. And they're, they are screaming out for you to satiate those feelings so you go on chasing and and going out partying and looking for the members of the opposite sex in the hopes that that will then satisfy you and 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 allow those feelings to uh, to go away and then if you're able to accomplish that you realize that that is a, a shallow endeavor and those feelings are still there right and that is it's like the um what is it with, uh, and I hate to bring this reference up, but it's the, the one I could think of at the moment, where uh, in Pirates of the Caribbean, when he's on the boat with all the dead uh, sailors, and they can eat and drink whatever they want because it's a bottomless hole. They will never be satisfied. And all these endeavors are just that. Right. They're distractions. Mm -hmm. They don't actually mitigate the emotions. They don't process the emotions in a healthy way. The other point you brought up was anxiety. Yeah. Right. So we, we pillory envy. We talk about envy being a bad thing. We feel shame around envy. And Nietzsche argues, use envy as motivation. Allow yes. it to fuel that fire. Now, he also believed that anxiety has meaning and it's an indicator of meaning. Yes. So anxiety is not something that we want to dull. It's not something that we want to run from. It's not something that's necessarily a bad thing. In fact, in those areas of our lives where we're starting to feel a little anxiety, it typically means, well, we got to push a little further because something amazing is just the other side of it. Yes. And this bears repeating. You only feel anxious things in your life that are important to you. Mm -hmm. So if you're feeling a little social anxiety right now, guess what? It's because we are wired for community. We are wired to communicate with one another. We are wired for connection. And it's also an indicator of an area where you should move into. If you're feeling anxiety about going out and socializing, that's because that is a new frontier in which you can develop yourself. And this is where modern science kicks in. Yes. Because psychologists call this experiential avoidance. Yep. And here's the thing. Experiential avoidance is highly correlated with low levels of life satisfaction. So if you are avoiding these things, if you are allowing anxiety to stop you from talking to people, if you are allowing anxiety to stop you from going out of your house, if you're allowing anxiety to stop you from leaning into your career and trying to go after these pursuits that really matter to you, well, guess what? This experiential avoidance leads to low life satisfaction. It leads to depression. Yeah, and I wanna go on that bit for a second. 
So there is a there is a new in internet culture. There's some new terms that I'm seeing Uh-oh. that are starting to come up over and over again. And this is where I I try to be hip with the kids, right? <laughs> I'm taking notes. <laughs> and so if this enters my world, then it's it's now coming into the mainstream. And there is this thing that the the, the kids are talking about, which is they're calling certain people doomers, and the doomers are people who are because of the internet having all the world's information on it and they're they're researching and they're doing all these things and they're looking at things in a, through a very scientific lens they tend to see the world as as empty uh, no, life has no meaning and become and they have a very um uh a nihilistic view that nothing matters. And once you go down that road, well, why are you going about to, uh, to develop yourself if there's no purpose in it? And what happens with this, if you continue to phosphor that and you're going to, if you can find other communities on the internet, we're just full of these people who can just lay in that f- feeling and of course if that's the case then your daily routine is looking of how can you distract yourself from these negative feelings negative feelings and the other term that that the that i'm seeing pop up which is then the doomers who are able to pull themselves out and to then they become bloomers oh doomed to bloom doomed to bloom and so the bloomers are then the are are those who have went through that depression, who have went through that nihilism, and managed to p- create and put together meaning in their life and a purpose that is larger than them, which involves self actualizing community and a life purpose and goal, which they can then chase, and then they've escaped these feelings of anxiety and depression that they're trying so desperately to avoid and distract themselves from they're now they've worked through them and they have this new outlook on life and if you can reach to that point then everything becomes a challenge it's blissful it's learning failure washes away because failure is now replaced with learning opportunities rejection has washed away because it's now filled with opportunities so how can you better yourself and so your framing of the of the world around you begins to change and there's a lot of work that has to go there and i think this is where another point where nietzsche talks about if you look into the abyss it looks back at you and then you have to go through that into the other side in order to be reborn in order to become the bloomer and a lot of times this will simply be a view of our own mortality Yes. Coming to grips with it, whether it's through the loss of a parent. I know I went through it losing my dad and it's a life shaking moment of, hey, this is very temporal. We need to make the most out of the little bit of time that we have. And that can can create this blooming that you're discussing. Now, I want to point this out because this is counterintuitive. Your comfort zone does not actually make your life better. And avoiding anxiety and discomfort is not helpful to your mental health, well-being, and life satisfaction. In fact, it is the reason that many of our clients come to see us in the first place. It's because their comfort zone that they've been hanging out in, avoiding this anxiety, avoiding this pain and fear of rejection and pain of acceptance, well, guess what? You're spinning your wheels a year, two years, three years, and all of a sudden you're like, I can't take this anymore. Nope. So when we are going about our daily lives and avoiding discomfort, avoiding anxiety, we are setting ourselves up for a greater fall that may even be unhealthy, may lead to those vices that Johnny was talking about that become the greater distractions. Well, and once you're there, right. And, and in our world, we can end up in that place where all we're trying to do is distract ourselves from these feelings and you can end up there rather quickly. Let's say that you're there at 25, right? And that's now here's what we're, our deal is to party, to do whatever we can to escape all of these feelings. 
you do that for a little while, let's say, as you were saying, one year, two years, three years, and eventually you have to project, okay, five years on the road, if I don't make a change, right, it's where am I going to be? The, the habits that you are sowing in order to deal with these feelings are only going to continue to get stronger and it's just going to be that much more difficult to climb out of. Yeah, the sense of regret at the end of the program of why did I wait so long? Mm -hmm. Why didn't I jump in feet first and just do it? So at, I'm 45 and here's what I'm... I'm starting to see posts on social media from the, the guys I used to hang out with in high school. And f in fact, I'm thinking of a particular post that I had saw just a few weeks ago, which is, wow, I just realized that I've wasted my whole life and have not accomplished anything. And I, I was like, oh, let's see how this goes. And there were some you know, people trying to cheer him up and oh, you know, and it's like, okay, you're now uh, uh, 40 some years old and you've decided and realized you haven't done anything. What's your next move? And of course the next move was what got him to 45 and not making anything in his life. His next move was, yeah, well, you know, yeah. And avoiding it, the abyss that he's staring at. And it's like, you can change that right now. That's our exact point. Transformation is not for everyone. Nope. It's difficult as we discussed, but the realization that you're here, you want to improve step one. Now, as we discussed, understanding anxiety and envy are not necessarily bad things to avoid. In fact, they can fuel this fire of transformation. Now, when we look at this desire to control our emotions, for some of us, it's mitigating that anxiety. It's mitigating that envy. Well, there's a study that deals with a very prevalent problem in our day and age, procrastination, that we thought was fantastic. And procrastination is a classic example of experiential avoidance yep. because it gives you short-term relief. Oh, I don't have to do that thing that I don't want to do at the expense of the long-term goal. And we all know our own battles with procrastination. Now, this study in 2013 titled Procrastination and the Priority of Short-Term Mood Regulation consequences for the future self. In this study, they look at the causes of procrastination. And what they found is that the focus on short-term mood repair that characterizes procrastination reflects not just the primacy of immediate mood over long-term goals and rewards, but the primacy of present self over the needs of future self. In other words, we procrastinate in order to improve our mood in the present moment, but it's always at the expense of our goals and our future self. In fact, the study published by Hayes, Strassel, and Wilson in 1999 showed that trying to not feel the negative emotions that we're currently feeling very often has the opposite effect. It actually strengthens the emotions. Yep. Avoidance strengthens. By the way, it's one of those names that sounds familiar. We had Dr. Hayes on our show twice in the past few months, episode 729 and 754, understanding that this avoidance causes more pain and strengthens all of what we're feeling and anxiety is not where we want to be. Well, we know through neuroplasticity that we're programming ourselves. So if you are avoiding, uh, looking for distraction, procrastinating, you are sowing actions that will soon be habits and then you're gonna have to live within these habits, the environment in which you created through your habits. So of course they're gonna reinforce those feelings. In fact, Ralph Waldo Emerson has a brilliant quote about just this. Sow a thought and you reap an action. Sow an act and you reap a habit. So a habit and you reap a character, so a character and you reap a destiny. Now, a lot of us put all of our focus on the destiny and the character that we want to become. We don't realize that self-actualization starts with your thoughts and which thoughts turn into actions. And there's something I want to 
to go along with this. And this, this is what we, we've discussed this, you know, and, and in fact, I remember we discussed this in detail with Drama, who we had on the show, about the difference between playing on, waking up and going on the offense every day or waking up and going on the defense. When you're on the defense, you sleep into whatever you want and then you get up and you handle things as they come at you, you, you're, you're being pushed in certain directions. You have no control over what's going on. You're just handling things as they come. When you wake up early and you get ahead of everything, you are now on offense. You now can dictate in the direction that you, that you want to be moving, which allows you then to, to when you wake up, then you're going to, you're going to move in to take action on the thoughts that you have. Now that you've taken action on the thoughts that you have, you're now looking to build habits for yourself. That Those habits that you're building for yourself have to be done on offense if you want them to move you in a certain direction rather than that direction being pointed out for you. Now that those habits have been built, you're now living in an environment that your habits have created for you. And now you become a product of that environment. So you're now this character. You're now this person that your environment has pressured you into. You can think of, of coal turning into this diamond. And now because you're on offense, you've, this character has been created. You are now in charge of what your destiny is going to be. It's a, it's amazing. It's a beautiful chain reaction of events that, that you can choose to, to, to go on. Now the caveat here is it's not about suppressing thoughts. It's about recognizing that only certain thoughts need to become actions. That's where a lot of us screw it up. In fact, Dan Wagner, a psychology professor at Harvard university did an experiment back in the eighties where he asked the study participants to not think of a white bear for five minutes. And whenever they did think of one, they had to ring a bell. Well, you can imagine how that went. What he found was that while one part of our mind is doing its best not to think of a white bear, there's another part of our brain that's constantly checking in saying, just want to make sure you're not thinking of that white bear right now. How's that going? And if that sounds ironic to you, well, guess what he's called this effect? It's called the ironic rebound in scientific research. This experiment has since become the infamous white bear problem. And since its publication in 1987 has sparked an entirely new field of study on thought suppression. Now we are digging deep into the science here. And this is why the third mindset shift that needs to happen for transformation to be possible is you can control how you behave, but you can't control what you think or feel. I'm going to say that again because it's a really important understanding when we think about transforming ourselves. You can control how you behave, meaning which thoughts turn into actions, but you cannot control or suppress your thoughts or emotions. That is the losing battle. And here we go. So when you wake up in the morning and you know what you have to be doing in order to act on a thought, in order to build a habit, in order to become this character, in order to create your destiny no matter how you're feeling, you have to do the thing you have to do when you know you have to do it, whether or not you want to do it. That self-actualization is in large part driven by discipline. Now, we had one of my favorite people and yours and somebody who has inspired us to go a little bit harder than normal. Extra, as extra the kids hard, say. Extra, to go harder. Uh, we had David Goggins on and David Goggins to me just very much represents that discipline of, I know how I feel. I know what's going on. I know what I want to be doing and I know what I'm going to be doing. And you know, for the people who, who think, Oh man, I just wish I could get up and, and run like that guy. He's, he's talked about staring at his shoes for 30 minutes going, God, what am I? God. And the first time he ran <laughs> and, and being, out of shape and overweight. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, again, look at the character, look at the destiny. They don't look at the process that got there. And on that, I can speak to my, for my own experiences. And you and I have this talk, we work out together. Uh, we have the same trainer 
And there are some of those days that are harder than some days I wake up before the alarm, bright eyed, bushy tailed, ready to go at it, throw at it, anything at me. I'm ready to take it on. And, and it's amazing. So, some days it's like, if I could just get this first cup of coffee down and get, I think I'm going to be all right. And it's, it's in those moments where this, you're a true test of the character that you want to be and how you're going to go work through that. And if it's a bribe to yourself in order to get it done, if it's pushing through whatever you're telling yourself to get it done, whatever. Well, a lot of it is multiple factors. It's an investment in yourself, a mm -hmm. monetary investment. Yep. It's accountability in your friend, in me, and accountability to the trainer because we booked his valuable time. Sure. It's understanding that these actions are not easy. Transforming oh. yourself is not easy. In fact, there are large forces working against us. So we have to do everything in our power to pull every lever. And listen, there are a number of people who call in and say, I want to take a program. I'm interested in a program. And I ask how they found us. And they say the podcast and they tell us, you know, I've tried a few things, but they haven't stuck. Yep. I need accountability. I need to be pushed to do this. I know what's good for me. I know the character that I want to become. I may not be clear on the destiny, but I know all the virtues that I want, but building those are not always easy. And it's okay to need a push, a helping hand, an investment, stakes, whatever the case may be to move you in the direction of transformation. And, and once you get these, these things moving, once you're over, once you're able to overcome your thoughts and do reap the actions that you, you want to be performing and be putting these habits together, becoming this character, you will, you will find yourself now looking and doing things differently. For instance, now that these habits and this character has been built within myself, I could tell you that on Saturday, which was a day that I didn't have anything to do. I, I could have, I could lounge and, and uh, all day. However, it was about two hours into my day where I realized that's not going to happen. I, so I had to clean the pool. I had to uh, do an hour of exercise. I had to finish a book that for uh, an author that we're going to have coming up and, and it was, and then go over some guitar lines for the band I'm in to, for the next rehearsal. It was at that point where I was finally like, huh, I can relax now. Now, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that Saturday of just lounging would have been a Saturday of just lounging. And when you put yourself in this position, you can't help but do these things because it's what needs to be done. It, it's the habits become ingrained mm -hmm. and, and that reinforcement allows you to now build the character that is disciplined, that shows up, that does the hard thing first, that doesn't look to shirk responsibility. Now, this is why we've built the boot camp and our core confidence group training. Yes. When we're looking to transform, we know we're fighting an uphill battle. So support is there, whether it's virtually in our group coaching program, core confidence, or whether it's in the boot camp, the immersive experience in LA for a week, you will be surrounded by classmates who are working through the same transformation struggle as you are. So you are now relatable, you know, as we talk about listening to the show, it puts you in an elite group. It puts you in a position where you view transformation as a good thing, not a scary thing, as a noble thing, as something that's worthy of pursuing. And as we started the top of the show with, you know, Nietzsche knew that his writing wasn't for everything. We know that it, this podcast is not for everyone. You know, and it was it was in, in learning that and seeing that written in 1870 and of how this pursuit was going to be looked at that allowed me to feel that that I was on the right track and this was worth pursuing and that not everyone is going to vibe with it and I would be ridiculed as an as it happened and it also allowed me to see it as you know, like if you look at self-development from one lens, it could just seem like, oh, that's a goody two-shoe thing. And, and I hope you have fun waking up at five to go to the gym. <laughs> and it's like 
that's one way to look at it. But there's also why are you thinking in that manner? You're envious. Uh, you, you have to deal with your own issues. In order to do that, you have to uh, admit to yourself that you are imperfect, that you have flaws. Absolutely. And 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 it was it was in that story and in this writing that I saw this as as it well, I don't I'm trying to think of the correct word that I want to use, but it was certainly it was the it was the most darkest and most interesting and most uh, reflective and learning about myself path that I, that I could have. And of course, once these habits get built, how you feel about yourself every day, and when you look back through journaling or being reflective of how you felt previously and realize that that's not happening again and how I feel and moving forward it is now and I hear this through a lot of people who are in the self-development who are in the self self-actualization is once they go on the offense and they get ahead they know much like civilization much like society it doesn't take very much for it all to go come crashing down it doesn't take very much for the anxiety, for the envy. To creep back in and control your actions. Absolutely. And so it, that's why it can seem as if those people who, who, who are getting ahead seem like they're running from something, like David Goggins. It could seem like he's running from something. Well, we, because we all know what we've come from. We all know what the abyss is. We've all been there. And guess what? We're not going back. Yeah, as we started the show with, right? These two driving forces, external, huge problem, concerned crises lead to transformation. And then there are the internal forces. And in large part, what tends to happen is you go through one transformation. And for a lot of our participants in the program, it is a transformation in job, career, or physical transformation. Yep. And once you go through that transformation, you come out the other side, you see the improvement, you see all the hard work that went into it, you now look at other areas of your life and say, okay, well, why don't I transform this area? Why don't I transform my social life? Why don't I transform myself romantically? Why don't I transform myself professionally? And it's funny, all it takes is one of these dominoes to fall yep. for the rest to start working in your favor. All right, now we got a little philosophical. We dump some science into the mix here yeah. when it comes to transformation. We want to end this episode with two solid techniques that you can use as you bounce from the show in your life to start transforming. And these two proven techniques are exactly what we teach in our program. So you're getting a little dose of what our students learn when they come work with us. The first one leverages our past success to boost us in the present. And in 2015 paper, Sonia Kang, Adam Galinsky, and their team showed evidence for what they termed low power threat and high power lift. Now, in short, when we feel in power, we pursue approach goals. We go for it. We get things done and our performance is elevated. However, when we feel powerless, we instead pursue inhibition goals, meaning we perceive everything as a threat. And so we retreat and do nothing. Here's what you need to do. This is called the 555 technique. And those of you who've gone through one of our programs are probably already familiar with it. Write down five things that you're good at. Then five things you're proud of. And we're going to end it with five situations where you completely rocked it. It doesn't matter what those are. This could be the day you gave a presentation five years ago and got standing ovations or that one time you cracked a joke at work and everyone burst into laughter. Note how this is very different from positive affirmations. These are not items that you wish were true or you're slowly working towards. All of them have already happened and you can look back on them as your successes. Now, the entire point of this technique, the 555, five things you're good at, five things you're proud of, five situations you completely rocked it, is designed to nudge you out of the powerless state.
that low power threat state and into the high power lift state where now you feel compelled, you feel full of power, your performance is elevated to take action. And this is where belief structures come in. You have to build these belief structures that allow you to act in a, and, and accordingly to feel powerful rather than powerless. Depending on what you're thinking about, that's gonna set a state. And one of the first things that we do in, in on Friday's class, in boot camp. In boot camp, which is let's start from a place of power. Because if you're at AOC, then you have already seen glimpses of your true power through life. If you hadn't seen that, you wouldn't be at AOC. You wouldn't have signed up. You wouldn't have signed up. And so, it's funny, I just want to point that out because a lot of times when we talk to the general public, when we talk to people outside of this entire self development space, they often ask us, who are the people that take your program, right? They yeah. think of the participants as hapless, hopeless, who don't have their things together. Couldn't be farther from the truth. Absolutely not. These are top performers who, because of a life event, an external event, or because of that need to improve Proof. and transform yep. another area of their life, they end up spending a week with us in LA. They're taking action. They've plateaued. They're looking for the next rung. They've they're, had a taste of power. They want to, more power in their they're life. They're looking to level up. So... Because they're there, they have already seen these moments where they have saw true glimpses of the power that is within them. And for them to come, it's how do I tap into that more consistently through life? So one thing we hear time and time again, I've had a taste, I've had a glimpse, I want more and I want it consistent. Be yeah, because w once we're, we we see it, it's like, well, I want more of that. Who who does it? Yeah, that great event where you lit up the room and people were enjoying it. That great date, that great job interview. Who doesn't want more of those experiences? So and it, it is at that point that you can start taking responsibility for the thoughts and the actions and the the habits and the character and then create the, the destiny but it has to start from a place of power that you've realized that you've seen that you want to capitalize on that you want to bring mo out more and that's how we start building those beliefs yes. that empower us yes now the good. second technique is asking the question of workability this digs deep into the findings of behavioral sciences and it's a bit more complex. So hang with me here. As we've discussed previously, you have no power over your thoughts and emotions. So that goes out the window. We're not trying to control those and certainly not trying to suppress those. But you do have the power to question whether or not they are helpful. So instead of saying, how do I stop worrying or how do I stop feeling anxiety or how do I deal with this problem? Ask yourself, is worrying or feeling anxious right now helping me become the person I want to be? I, is all of this worrying, that. is all of this anxiety actually helping me self-actualize? Now, sometimes the answer to that question might be yes. Just think of preparing for a job interview or an exam. Obviously, anxiety is going to be a part of it. Or when you're walking into the unknown, you're doing something for the first time. You don't know what you're going into, so of course you're nervous. Of course you have a bit of anxiety. You don't know, you're unprepared. That pressure can lead to more preparation and improve performance. But more often than not, you'll find that these experiences are not helpful. Or as psychologists would say, they are not workable. This is the concept of workability. If you're at a social event and you're preoccupied with worries about what people think about you or you're feeling anxious, guess what? That's not going to help you have great conversations, have connection, enjoy the moment. You know, when I, when I have those thoughts, right? When I, when I am worried or I have anxious, um, I am being anxious. There's some anxiety going on. I indulge in it for a second. I go, okay, we're feeling this way. Let's let's just go right into it. Let's just freak out. How's that? How's that gonna help us out? Go ahead, just lose it. I'm like, well, now you put it that way. That's not no, really I don't want to lose it. <laughs> it's not gonna do anything more. It's not gonna help me out. It's only gonna make things worse. The other great question to ask yourself is: If I didn't have these thoughts and feelings, if I felt super confident, how would I behave right now? Yes. Right? Counterbalance it. Think about the opposite. Now, 
Because of that, you actually have a workable solution, right? You can stop wasting energy trying to change those thoughts and you can now put energy into the behaviors you've identified that you want to become as we're building that character. Maybe your answer to the question is along the lines of, well, if I were perfectly confident, I'd stand much closer to the high traffic areas, I'd open my body language up, I'd make great eye contact, and I'd say hi to people that walk past. The important thing to realize is your answers here need to be concrete actions, right? Everything we talked about, stand closer in high traffic areas, open up your body language, make better eye contact, say hi to people as they walk past. These are all things that you would be doing confidently and these are concrete actions, right? That's what we're looking for by asking these questions. When we're thinking about workability, we want things to be actionable. So these, these other, the, the, you know, the anxiety, the, the worrying, the nervousness, all, everything that goes with the, 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 the other feelings that are keeping you from doing the things that you want to be doing, those are lower tier feelings. They're only a distraction. And if you don't awaken yourself to those, then they are going to push you in a, in a direction that is not your, the path you want to be on. That's going to push you into the abyss to rise through it. You have to awaken to these feelings and then choose to move forward with stronger feelings and conviction. And this is why when we look around, we can see that, that most people, the reason they're not interested in self-development is because you could say that they're sleepwalking through life. They haven't awoken to the opportunity to become better. Why? Because there's a lot of work that's going to go into this, but you know, that's, and that's where we are. And, and I, and I love it because the, when I first realized that I, the, the thing that I was, that I started noticing was just how asleep everyone was around me. Um, and it's, and I, I basically stated that it is, as, it is, it's as if they're asleep at the will. And you know what happens if you fall asleep at the wheel. And we've talked about this on the show for a decade plus, seeing the matrix, mm -hmm. right? Understanding the power within yourself to transform, understanding how to mitigate the factors that are working against you and highlight the factors that will empower you to build those actions into habits, those habits into your character and achieve your destiny. Now, we want to end with a challenge, the same challenge we just posed earlier. We want you to write down your 555 list yeah. and put it somewhere you'll see often. We want you to be reminded of your past successes as often as possible. And if you're up to it, send us your list. Let us know what you came up with. Johnny and I are fascinated to see your 555. You can let us know. We're excited to hear from you as always. Head on over to theartofcharm.com slash questions. You can record your voice. You can shoot us an email, questions at theartofcharm.com. And as always, you can find us on social at The Art of Charm, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Also, if you could do us and the entire Art of Charm team a big favor, leave us a review on iTunes. Head on over there, find our show, leave us a review. It helps other people like yourself find us, and we love and enjoy reading them.